The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we got a very powerful lesson. We're going to talk about overcoming fear. And we've talked about overcoming fear before and how to overcome fear and triumph over it. And we, we've talked about it in so many different contexts. But in saying that, we've never discussed it the way I'm going to be talking about it today. Specifically dealing with end times. We're going to look at overcoming fear in the generation in which the Lord returns. And if, if this applies to that generation, it applies to us. I've been posting some stuff on our Facebook and our Instagram recently about some, some Q&A on biblical end times. Some of the most asked questions that people bring to us. And I had a little conversation with a couple different people in the comments. And the thing that kept coming up is this aspect of deception that leads to offense. And I wanna say something today before we get started. What allows you to be deceived? The thing that allows you to be swept up in the deception of what's gonna happen hereafter is gonna be first and foremost, willful ignorance. What you don't know will kill you. And I, and, I, and I hold no punches when I say that. I'm trying to be clear with you. If you do not study what the Bible says, we're talking about the full canon of Scripture. You know, we, when I was, let me, let me talk about me, not you. When I was growing up in the Lord, for the first bunch of years of my salvation, I, I studied faith. I studied the power of God in the Holy Ghost. There were certain things that I really put an emphasis in, but the end times was not it. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense. I didn't know anybody else that was studying it. I didn't know anybody else that could explain it to me. And because of that, I just relegated it off. But the more I push into this subject and the more we start to unpack biblical end times, the more I see a strong... Um, I don't know another way to say it, but you need it. A strong, I don't want to say strong desire, but a strong uh, push. Or I realize that there is a gap in the modern day church versus the church that Jesus will be coming back for as a prepared bride. So we have went into this study to talk about biblical end times. And the, the thing I want to tell you today is that if you don't know, if you are unlearned, if you are willfully ignorant, if you are somebody that doesn't have understanding, you are more likely to be deceived. And we've talked about that already where people say, well, I don't have to study it because I won't be deceived. And we already talked about that right there is a root of the Tower of Babel. It's already in deception because you're saying that I can find my own way to heaven outside of what Jesus has told me to do. And Jesus said that you have to study these things. So, the other thing that I want to say, there's really a couple main things. We're only going to just talk about two of them real fast. The first one is willful ignorance. You know, we have to be people of understanding. We've talked about that a bunch. That's probably one of my number one uh, calls when I minister to people is do not be ignorant. But the other thing I want to tell you is that fear what you don't know is 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 allowing fear to come over your life i was thinking of some great examples of overcoming fear and some of the things i was thinking about was the aspects of the fact i overcome fear when i know what the outcome is 
You know, I, I was thinking about when you sit outside of a, a principal's office, when you know you get called to the office, and you don't know if you're about to be in trouble because maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but you're at the principal's office. Maybe you did something wrong and you didn't know, or and you all those things start to go through your head, and you start to value every little choice you've made in that moment. And in that moment, fear is gripping your heart because you are unsure of the outcome. You're unsure of what's about to take place. The same thing when you're, I know it's a bad example, but when you're going through like a, a, a haunted house or you're watching a scary movie, not that I recommend you do either of those things, but the point being is before you go in, you know, I wasn't always saved, before you go in, you're not scared. Or maybe when you're about to go in, you start getting scared because you don't know what's in there. You know, I remember one time, this was back when I was a heathen, that I went to a haunted house and I was going out through this like tunnel thing and you have to crawl out. Well, when you're in it, you don't know where you're at. And then, you know, fear starts to grip your heart. This is way before I got born again. But when I finally got out and I turned around, it's a tunnel just sitting on the ground outside the house. I mean, when you look at it from the outside perspective and when you see the end, there's no more fear. Fear is only gripping you on what you don't know in the middle of a circumstance that is very uh, extreme or very, uh, let's just say it is going to be violent. I mean, when the wrath of God gets poured out, the rage of the Antichrist and the sin of men, when, every, when all these different things come together, it is going to create an environment in which fear will rise to levels never before seen in history. So I want to talk about how to overcome that fear today. We're going to look at Luke chapter 21. And we're also going to look at Zephaniah 3. You might say, Zephaniah, what is, what, where is, is that even in the Bible? It is. If you go to page 1020, or at least that's the page in my Bible, you'll get to Zephaniah 1. It's only three chapters. It is a minor prophet. If you just go to Matthew and just kind of work your way back, just take your time and you'll find it pretty quick. It's before Haggai, and it's after uh, Habakkuk. That's where we see Zephaniah. And we're going to talk about it for just a minute today because the Lord has been speaking to me specifically out of Zephaniah since yesterday. So we're going to, we're going to look at Zephaniah 3, or just a passage of it, which will bring some understanding on how to overcome fear. One more quick announcement before we get started. Remember, we do have our discipleship curriculum. Our, our discipleship curriculum is every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. We we are we had our uh, Law of Faith teaching last night. We are having our teaching on John 14 tonight, and what we're going to talk about right now is going to be tied into John 14. So please make sure that if you're in our advanced curriculum, you're in class tonight. And then Thursday night, we are dealing with our final and seventh church of the book of the Revelation. We're dealing with the church of Laodicea. After the church of Laodicea, we're doing abomination, harlot, biblical signs of the time. Three weeks left until the end of the quarter. So I encourage you that if you're like, hey, I want to know more about the end times. You know, I've, I've asked the question and proposed it to so many people. Where is your level of knowledge on biblical end times? for most people it's very low not a whole lot but I encourage you to study it and to get versed in what the Bible says according to the end times not what a pastor says not what your friend says not what the news says if you can't see it with your own eyes in your own Bible then don't receive it from anybody not just me I encourage you to make sure that whatever you say when you teach end times you can prove with your own Bible. If you can't back it with the Word of God, if it's just somebody's opinion, then don't say it. We only declare what the Bible says very clearly. And remember, the end times study that we're in and what we're declaring is not about arguments. I don't care about winning an argument. I don't care about being somebody that knows more than everybody else. None of that matters to me at all. What matters to me is preparing a church, preparing a bride, preparing the inheritance of Jesus to be prepared, not only prepared, but to remain faithful in an hour and a generation in which pressure will be like never before seen in history. 
The more I study it, the more it moves my heart to teach it because I want you to be prepared. Because I want to see you in the new Jerusalem, walking with us when we walk with Jesus. I, I want you there. But to get you there, I need to make sure that you are people of understanding so that you remain faithful. You're not deceived. You're not in fear. You don't get offended. You don't fall away. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us to the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, go with me to Luke chapter 21. We're going to Luke chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distresses of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now, this is a snippet of a conversation in Luke chapter 21. Because when you look at 21, People call it the, the, the Olive Discourse or the Olivet Discourse because this is with Jesus having a conversation with his disciples. But Luke 21 is a direct parable, or a direct, not a direct parable, a direct harmony to Matthew 24. So if you remember, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 are Jesus' greatest teaching on biblical end times. But we don't separate Matthew 24 and 24, 25 out from the rest of the Bible because Matthew 24 and 25 has a harmony in Luke and in Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give details and understanding on the passages dealing with the end times. We just usually reference Matthew 24, 25. But it's also in Luke chapter 21. But in Luke chapter 21, Luke brings a specific detail that's very interesting. You remember Luke's a physician or Luke was the physician so when he gives this information on the end times he pulls out a very specific detail he talks about the severity of what is going to be taking place in the generation in which the Lord returns and he says men's hearts failing them for fear now that is that is an important and powerful statement that the things that will be taking place in the generation in which the Lord's, Lord returns, is that men's heart will fail them because of fear. Now, hearts failing them, that is one word. Hearts failing them is one word in the Greek, and it means literally to breathe out, meaning it's like that moment of fear when your heart grips and you're out of breath and you, you can't catch your breath because you're so afraid. That's what it's referring to. It, it's, it's that moment where it's like, uh, you, you don't you don't know what to do you, you can't breathe you, you you've breathed out because you've because uh, you've seen it but then in that moment it's like you can't breathe in you can't get any oxygen your your mind is racing 100 miles an hour your heart feels like it's gripped and you're overcome with fear it also means because the word for means that this is what's causing it is fear and this fear is this this, uh, this overwhelming pressure of the things that are happening in the earth at this time, referring to what is taking place in the generation in which the Lord returns. Now this is important because we pulled out only four verses out of a passage dealing with the vengeance of God. When we look at the judgments of God taking place on the earth, even looking at the fact that Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles, now, what that's referring to is that's referring to when the abomination of desolation takes place and when the Antichrist is on the world stage trotting down Jerusalem, destroying the city. Now, Jerusalem is the city of the great king. The, the end times context is Israel focused and Jerusalem centric because that is Jesus' city and he is coming to destroy the person that's oppressing the city of Jerusalem that's oppressing the people of Israel, the Jews. Now that's so important to understand that in the middle of this passage, 
it says when all of these things are happening when all of these signs start to take place wars and rumors of wars and, and pestilence and earthquakes and and fire and and drought and, and and the and the antichrist is raging and killing christians and 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 rolling over the city of jerusalem trotting down the city of jerusalem and when all of these things are taking place in that context it says men's hearts will fail them because of fear and that's that's very important because after that it says when these things start look up your redemption draweth nigh meaning that there are people that will be so gripped with fear it's like their heart will stop them they, like you won't be able to keep going because of the fear of what is going to be taking place but then there's another group that when they see all of these things they will rejoice they will lift their hands they will begin to praise god because the redemption of the saints draweth nigh it's coming it's coming soon it's now and that's two important responses to the same exact scenario, the same exact context, the same exact environment. The wrath of God against the Antichrist, the rage of the Antichrist against the same, the, uh, against the saints, and the, the sin of all of the people in the world coming together and the cultivation of that environment where wheat and tares rise at the same time and transgressors come into their fullness. Sometimes we forget that verse out of Daniel where it talks about the fact that transgressors are sinners and sin will come to its fullness. You know, sin is not in its full extent right now because there is things restraining. You mean the governments of the world restrain evil. You know, that's through laws. You can't just go around killing people. It's not okay. I mean, you go to prison for it. I did a, a little verse on our Instagram that says, yes, you can. No, you shouldn't. Because I talk about the fall, the fact that everything, yes, is lawful. You can go and do whatever you want. But understand that sin has consequences. Maybe you can go out and shoot somebody if you really want to. Yes, you can. But you better understand you're going to prison for it. There's consequences. So no, you shouldn't go do that. The same thing with sleeping with a prostitute or snorting cocaine or stealing from your local store. Yes, you can do them, but no, you shouldn't. The same thing in this generation is like all of these things will be taking place and there are two main responses. There's the response of the people that were caught unaware. The people that didn't know it was coming. The people that are unlearned and, and their hearts are gripped with fear. But then there's the other group of people that see it and know that my redemption draweth nigh. I know that my salvation is coming very soon. This is a powerful passage. I don't, I don't know if this is blessing you. It's definitely blessing me. I want you to go to Zephaniah chapter 3. I gave you enough time to look for it. <laughs> Zephaniah 3, right before the book of Haggai. We're going into chapter 3, just for reference sake. Mine is 1022. That's my page number in case you want to have it a little bit easier to try to find in your Bible. But go with me to Zephaniah chapter 3. I want to... I want to read these last couple verses in Zephaniah, and, and then I want to talk about it for just a minute. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all thy heart, with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments, he hath cast out thine enemy, the King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. Who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden? Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gathereth her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, 
For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth, and I will turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Now this is such a powerful response. <clears throat> and it's really a, I mean, it's a declarative command by God. God said, this is what I tell you. And a lot of people know that very last verse in Zephaniah. It says, I will make you a name and a praise in the earth, and I will bring you back from your captivity, and I will set you before men. I mean, people know that verse. But people disconnect what is going on in Zephaniah's generation when he prophesies this of the Lord. So for a context sake, let's talk about Zephaniah for just a minute. We're going to end up coming back to Zephaniah when we start studying chapter for chapter. But for now, I just want to overview it for just a second. Zephaniah prophesied in the days of Josiah. Now that's important because the context frame is if you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah was called in the days of Josiah. So Zephaniah was prophesying when Jeremiah was called. But the thing I want you to know about this, without going too far into detail, is there was a reform taking place in the nation of Israel or in the, the nation of Judah, Judah's the southern kingdom where Jerusalem's at. They're making a reformation to get the people back to the Lord. If you read through Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, if you just go and read through all of it, you'll see this happen. Up, down, up, down, up, down, over and over and over. We serve the Lord, it goes up. We decide not to serve the Lord, we go down. We serve the Lord, we go up. We don't serve the Lord, we go down. And it's just this constant like wave. And when they would go down, God would call a prophet. And the prophet would prophesy and say, turn back to the Lord. And then the people would turn back and we rise up. And in the days of Josiah, they are in a reformation. They're, they're reforming and bringing the people back to serving the living God. Because they've been in idol worship for so long. And this is important because as Zephaniah is, is prophesying to these people, there is a group that has turned their heart back to the Lord. It's called the remnant. And that's where the Lord was speaking to me out of chapter 2. I'm not going to talk about that just yet. But not everybody received. There's a, there's, a, there's a group of people that go after the Lord, and then there's another group of people that kind of half-heartedly go in. And we see later on that not only does Zephaniah prophesy about the impending judgment of what happens to the nation of Judah and to the city of Jerusalem when Babylon destroys it, but also he's prophesying of the end times. Because we see it over and over. Like I said, we'll come back into this fully in detail later. But he says, in that day, in those times, in that day. Referring to the fact that he's prophesying of something that will take place later on. And in that, it said, we see God's judgments against the nations that oppress Jerusalem. And not only the judgments of God against that, but the, the judgments of God against a people that have chosen to forsake the Lord. But then God speaks out and he cries unto the remnant. He cries unto the people. And at the very end, he says, Sing, fear thou not. He said, I'm telling you, don't be gripped with fear. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. The part that the Lord was speaking to me so heavily in Zephaniah is the fact that the people are not believing of what God has said he will do. Now that comes in two fashions. The first way in which the people are unsure of what God's word coming to pass is the fact that they trust because we're in the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. Remember, Israel has civil war, Israel's top, Judah's bottom. Jerusalem's in the bottom, it's in Judah. And the people of the southern kingdom of Judah, where Jerusalem is at, believe, well, we had the temple. You know, God's not going to destroy us. There is covenant promises made to this land and to this city. This is the city of the great king. This is, this is his city. What do, what do you mean they're going to destroy us? There's no way we're going to be destroyed. So the first group of people that aren't believing in what God said is the people that have put their trust in things outside of what God is saying. You know, you put your trust in your temple or in your money to deliver you. God says those things will be brought to naught. Those things cannot save you from me. 
My discipline will come against you. He said, you must understand there is nothing that you can put your trust in that can stop me. That's the first group. The second group is the people that are crying out to the Lord. It's the remnant. God, uphold your promises. God, you spoke these things. And yet everything outwardly is contrary to what you have spoken. It's this fact where, God, you spoke promises. God, you spoke of judgment against evil. And the Lord is saying in both aspects, to everybody that listens, He's saying, hear me, O ye Jerusalem. I am not slack concerning my promises. I will bring to pass everything that I said. I will make you a praise in the earth. Now, this is specifically talking about the nation of Israel and the southern kingdom. Of, it's, it's talking about Israel and, and the Jews. But this applies to all of God's people. This is a covenant promise with God. And the principle that you need to understand is God is saying, the fact that you're in fear is because of the fact you don't believe I'll do everything I said I would do. And that's where the Lord spoke to me out of, Hag or out of Zephaniah 2. The Lord said, everything I told you, I will bring to pass. It doesn't matter whether they believe it. It doesn't matter whether they agree with it. It doesn't matter if you stand by yourself. He said, I will do everything I told you I would do. And he said, your response, sing, O daughter of Zion. That is so powerful because when we take that and we compare it with Luke chapter 21, men's heart fail them because of fear. Yet it says, when you see it, lift your hands and rejoice. Your redemption draweth nigh. It's right here. Don't be overcome with fear and all of the circumstances and the things that are going on. Understand the plan of God. Rejoice. Lift your hands and cry out to the Almighty God and praise ye the Lord. Because everything he has ever spoken to you, he will make come to pass. The Lord will cause all of it. He said, I will cause shame to come on everybody that did not receive the word that I gave. And we're out of time today, but I, I pray this blesses you. This is how you overcome fear. You stand knowing what's coming knowing that the Lord will uphold His promise and praising and rejoicing the Lord in all circumstances. And Father, we thank You for it. We give You all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow Oh, the troubles to come The lily's not thinking about the seasons The drought or the flood the tree that's planted by the water isn't faced by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. You take good care of me. You know what I need before I even ask for things. And you hold me in your hands with the kindness. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it casts. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good.